and and then I'm going to highlight me to start with. Spotlight me. Well, good morning, everybody. <laughs> uh, today, today I'm going to tie uh, an extension from the pattern that I tied last week, or a part thereof. Uh, and this is it. This is just for those of you who have an interest in different tying techniques. And if you might want to go fishing for uh, bonefish and permit one day, that's what this is. This is a shrimp pattern and it fishes this way, upside down. So we'll start, the, the, one of the interesting things with this guy is it has a pair of eyes. And those eyes are, uh, let's see if I can get my thingy here to work right. Okay, I'm gonna readjust so that you can see. Oh, that's the next thing. Why am I having trouble with this? Okay, so there's the, there's the hook. Let's set my there we go. That's more like it. Okay, now, so what I'm going to do first is I'm going to show you how to do the eyes. This is uh, Maxima, uh, 40 pound. And what I'm going to end up with is a pair of eyes on one piece of monofilament. So that's it there. And so how do we do this? Well, first we take a strand of monofilament off of the spool. I'm going to cut off about oh, four inches, three, four inches of that. And then I have a pair of forceps. And I'll grab it, grab it right in the middle. And then I'll have what on the outside looks like a, a fish, but it's actually a, a butane lighter. <laughs> and I'll start this up if, I, if it will be kind enough to actually give me a flame. And I bring the end of the uh, mono close, but not touching the flame and melt, melt it as best I can into a blob. Sometimes catches, but that's life. I'll do the same with this side. So that's how you create the little bulbs on the end. And why do you do both ends? It's easy to manage in the, with the forces. It's easy to manage the mono and get it close to the flame without the whole thing going up in flames. And then you can cut it in half to do each eye. Now those are transparent. Why is this falling? I don't want to turn off center stage here. There we go. That's more like that. Okay. So now all you've got to do to get them black is you go to your local neighborhood hobby shop and get yourself a thing of black model paint. And the easiest way to do this is you can use a brush to do this, but the easiest way is just simply take the cap off the model paint and there's some model paint in there. And then just very carefully dip it into the paint that's adhered to the cap. And you end up with black eyes. Put the cap on. If you ever decide to make a plastic model, you've got lots of black paint for that. And then while the paint dries, I stick it into one of these thingies here that I have handy and a little holder to let the paint dry. Set it aside on a little stand I've got. Okay, now that, that's the start point. That way it, all the mucky stuff is out of the way before you start tying. Okay, now the next order of business is to put the eyes on the hook. Um, and the hook, by the way, I've, I've chosen a sort of medium size. This is a number 10 salt water streamer wave uh, by Hannock. It's a, got a little extra long shank and it's 
barbless so I don't have to crush the barb down all the time. And I put it in the vise and I've got, I've got my midge jaws uh, in the vise because I need access to around the bend more than what my regular jaws give. Now, thread. I'm going to use white uh, 140 dernier. And I'll start that right behind the eye. And a few wraps right behind the eye just to close up that little gap. You know, if, if you look at how, how the hooks are made, they always leave a little gap uh, when they run the, the eye around like that. And sometimes if you're using a really fine tippet, it can get caught in there and fray and, and break. So now I'm going to wrap this guy pretty much a little more than a third of the way down the shank. Probably halfway would be a good spot. And then trim it off. Now for this pattern, the eyes get tied on what is normally the top of the hook because you want this pattern to fish up, upside down with the hook point up. When you're fishing for permit and, and, and uh, fish like that, you're fishing in a bottom of a flat that's got a marl on the bottom or a sandy bottom. And you want the, the eyes to be down on the bottom so the hook doesn't get caught in the bottom. And then I'll finish wrapping down the hook just to cover the hook. And the eyes on this guy are going to go just about where the barb would normally be on a hook maybe just just a hair behind the point so at that point i'm going to use the trick that bob clauser uses when attaching eyes i'm going to build a little bump just behind the point of the hook you see the little bump of thread and what that does is that helps keep the eyes from spinning around the hook makes it easier to attach them so i will hold them at a 45 degree angle behind the bump wrap once, twice in between, then twist them so they're parallel to the shank, the right angles to the shank, I should say, and I'll make three or four wraps on the other side. And then I'll regularly do some more, three or four on diagonal wraps back to front, and then diagonal wraps front to back. And just to make sure that they're not gonna go anywhere, I'm gonna use this stuff, it's called JB Weld, and I used to get the the stuff that uh, was sold at Home Hardware, but they just don't carry it anymore. But I did find this stuff at Canadian Tire, and it's a brushable super glue in a nice little bottle. And it actually seems to be a little better bottle than the other version. I'll just give a touch in between the eyes, and that will soak in, and hopefully. Those eyes will not spin around on me anymore. Okay, so the, once we're there, we're going to start tying the fly from the bottom side up, but on the top to start with. The first material that I'm going to put on is this stuff, which is Arctic Fox fur, white. And the reason I like this is it's, it's nice and white. There's a teeny bit of gray in the bottom. Um, it's very fine fur and it's quite soft. So when it gets wet, it's going to skinny down uh, quite a bit. Um, and it's it when it's 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 also going to move in the water really nice. So I'll take a, a chunk of that off the hide. And they, you're kind of limited in how long a fly you can do because this stuff is not really long. And I'll just slick it down a little bit with some spit just to make it manageable. And I'll take the fluff off the end. And I'll do the same trick that we did with tying clouser minnows. I'll make sure the end is square and about an eighth of an inch in front of where I'm pitching it with my fingers. And I'll set that right down with my thread in front of the eyes. I'll set my Set it right down on top, in between the eyes, and just do a loose wrap till I get it where I want it. 
and then I will tighten it down and bind down the butt. So there we go. We have the first little bit of material on the fly. From here on out, everything is on the other side. So I turn my vise upside down. It's a rotary. I've got a, I can kind of lock it there so it's not going to spin much. And then the second thing I want to do is get the stuff that's on the underneath of the fly in. And if you look at the construction of this fly, uh, the next next piece is I'm going to put some more white hair, but it's going to be stiffer stuff. So it's a, a fish hair, kind of a crinkly product. It comes in a tube like that. And you can probably get a variety of different styles. You could use EP fibers. Uh, there's a variety of materials you can use. And I only, I only need a little bit because this is not a, a huge bulky fly. So I'm going to measure if I scrunch it, if I let it go soft, about a gap width of, of material. And I want the length to be, a, measure the length out to a little bit beyond where the white uh, Arctic fox fur ended. And I'm going to cut it about half shank length up. So same thing here, trim it, trim it square um, and trim it so that it's, again, that kind of eighth inch. Now this time I'm going to tie it in just about halfway up where I tied the fox fur in, halfway up the fox fur. And I'll make that loose wrap again. So that it ties on a little bit in front of where the fox fur was tied down to the shank. And then I will wrap it right back to where the eyes are. And I'll take this and I'll lift it up a bit so that some goes on either side of the hook point. This makes it a little easier to put the legs and stuff on. You see it sticks out a bit past the end here. Uh, so I'm going to want to trim this down just a little bit. And when I do, I'm going to do it raggedly. I'm going to put my scissors in to trim it down to the right length, about the same length as the fox fur. But I don't want to trim it square. So that's why I put my scissors in at an angle and trim it so that it, it's kind of ragged at the end. Okay. Ah. The next thing we want is some rubber legs. There we go. The next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to need my rubber legs. And you, these stuff, this stuff you can get at Robinson's. It's uh, micro legs, rubber legs, and these ones are barred. They have a nice, nice little, they're kind of pink and uh, they're, they have enough markings on them to make them visible, but not too much. So with this, I'm going to do what I usually do with rubber legs. I'll bring, bring the thread forward again, just in front of where I, just right at where I tied in the previous material. And I'll wrap that around the hook half half on half half and i'll tie it down on the top and i'll take the one one rubber leg and i'll make a few wraps gently tugging on it back toward the eye the, with the eyes alongside the hook shank on the far side of the hook and i'll take the other rubber leg and i'll do the same thing on the near side of the hook. And I'll rest them in, in the little space between the eyes there. So they're sitting on top of the dumbbell eyes. And I will wrap my thread back down the hook right to in front of the eyes, trying to avoid the hook shank. And that leaves your rubber legs, one on either side, hanging down. And because they're fairly hefty, I don't want them too long, so I'm gonna, Take them in my left hand and give them a little tug and cut them off even with the fur. 
So there's my rubber legs. Now I'm going to do the same thing with some, this is a mirage accent, but it's basically a crystal flash. Uh, so I'm going to take a little bit of this stuff. I'm going to probably get three or four strands. And I'm going to do the same thing with that. So this is a mirage crystal flash. And I'm going to want to at least two or three strands. And I'll do the same thing. I will wrap that around the thread, half, halfway divided in half. And I'll put it on top of the hook, hold it down. And then I'll put two on the far side of the hook, around the point. And I'll take this other set on the near side of the hook and let that down the side. Again, laying them in the little space between the eyes, some on one side of the hook and some on the other. Get in place. And then I'll wrap back over that. So there we go with our eyes. Now what I'm going to do is bring my thread back up. To just in front of where all of this other stuff has been tied in. And this is where I tie in the eyes. So you can see there's a little bit of a curve to this. I want these eyes to actually stick up a little bit when it's, uh, when it's being fished. So I want the eyes to go on so that there's a slight curve and curving out and up. So what I'll do is cut the the pair in half. Yeah, there you go. And I'm going to put the eyes about, I'd say, two thirds of the way back on the back of the body. There, I don't know if you can see that about there, two thirds of the way back. And I'm going to catch it halfway down the hook shank and wrap. Again, putting that nylon in that little gap between the eye and the hook shank. And I'll wrap that right down to where it is. Bring my thread back up. And at this point, I'm going to lift this up, take my forceps, and I'm going to, or pair of pliers, probably even better. Take my pair of pliers, and I'm going to flatten that little piece of mono. it off and the purpose of the flattening is that the thread will grab onto that and it won't let it go so that the eyes will not pull out so uh, where'd it go there you go there it is and then I'll just I'm just going to take my thumbnail and I'm going to bend these eyes out and up a little bit And you'll see it in a little while what that's going to look like. I want to make sure it's on the proper side of the hook here. There we go. There we go. Get it on the right side of the hook. Okay, take the other eye. Where the hell it went? There it is. There it went. <laughs> Oh, well, I've got this one. That's why I make a whole bunch more of these than I need. If I drop them on the floor, I at least can keep going without uh, having to stop and make another pair of eyes. <laughs> so now I'm going to put this one on, on the near side of the hook in the same, roughly the same position with the eye sticking out to the side. Where did that go? It's just not sitting where I want it. There we go. So I'm going to put the other eye in here. Again, lay it alongside the hook. Catch it there. 
wrap back and try and hold it in place when I wrap it back. So it's going to stay in the same spot. And then come back down and do the same thing with the pliers just to flatten it out so it doesn't pull out on me. Snap it there. My vice is not cooperating this morning on holding on to this hook. I need to tighten it up. All right. Now I'll wrap my thread down here. And we're almost getting close to being done. Make sure all the bits and pieces are where I want them. So I have some rubber legs and some hackle on one side, a rubber leg and hackle on the other side, and crystal flash on both sides. And then the last bit I'm going to, second last bit I'm going to do here is I've got this yak hair. And you could probably use uh, the same fish hair as you use for the other parts of the body. But I like this yak hair because it's got a nice light pink sheen to it. And uh, I'll do the same thing. I'll, I'll pick out, I'd say, when you scrunch it together, about half, about a gap width of, of pinkish yak hair. Maybe a little longer than what I've got on there now, just because I need to tie it in further up the shank this time. So I'm gonna tie this in probably where I've got that taper ends for where, it, so as you can see what I'm doing with each individual tie, I'm tying it in a little bit further forward than the last one. And the idea is that, that is that that gives you a uh, a tapered front to the body. I just took the really long ones out, matched the ends up, and then trim them off square. I'll bring my thread forward to probably quarter shank length behind the eye. And the same thing as I've done before. A loose wrap to get it down. And then I'll put it on either, just divide it on either side of the hook point and then wrap back over that down the hook shank. So now I have the pink stuff on the very top. Never take it back more than in front of the eyes. Bring my thread forward. And the last thing I want to do is make a shiny front to the body. And the way to do that is I've got a tube of crystal flash. And I wish I'd discovered this method of the people storing crystal flash before. Uh, it's on a, it's in a tube with a uh, zip tie. So you can keep it all maintained. It doesn't get frizzed all over the place. And to get the numbers that you want out of here, you just kind of... You remember, Dave, a, a little while back, I uh, said you can get them at the florists. Yep. I went up to my local florist and just bought <clears throat> the charge me 10 cents. Ah, there you go. He recently just sold me about 20 of them. Yeah, cool. So I'm going to take a, a good chunk of these out. And I'll do the same thing. i cut this off. And uh, I will wrap them around the shank, hold it on top, and then I'll wrap over thing, everything back to back over top, all the way back, just loose wraps all the way back to the where the fur is tied in front of the eyes. Bring my thread forward, and I'll take this crystal flash and give it a, a slight twist just to keep it from being too spread out. And I'm going to wrap that down the nose of the fly here. 
and you see it, it broadens, it flattens out so you don't build up too much bulk. And when I get to where the eye is, I'll come up and tie that down. Back. Just make sure all the wispy bits are over the end. Trim them off. Trim them off. And I will do my whip finish. I'm almost done. So the last thing I do is I do a little bit of a trim job on the tag end of this. I want it a little bit ragged at the butt end. I don't want everything to too much up the back. So I see my crystal flash is a little long. So I'm just going to trim those back here. And I'll do this same thing. I'll put my scissors in at an angle from the back and kind of trim it roughly the same length all the way back, sort of a, an arc shape, shaped like that. So now you can see I've got a pair of eyes on either side mixed in with all of the, the flash and the fur. And that's everything except the last thing I want to do to make sure nothing goes awry if a fish gets a tooth in there, as I'll take some Sally Hansen's and I'll just coat this guy with Sally Hansen's hard as nails. And then if it gets nicked by a tooth, it's not gonna unravel. And that's it. There's your shrimp. And I can now de-spotlight me. There we go. So that's it. Nice bonefish fly, Dave. Yeah, that's a that's a good bonefish fly. Question for you guys. Yeah. Uh, you know, when it comes to trout fishing, there is a huge pile of books on the various things that trout eat. So, you know, you go in and you learn your mayflies, your damsel flies, your dragon flies, your, you know, stone flies, and so on and so forth, all the way up to various bugs and, you know, back swimmers and that kind of stuff. But for salt water, is it just anything that moves is fair game no nope. as food or is there any sort of similar knowledge base where you can kind of you know as a newbie basically i'm just wondering okay so i when i get to a stream or a lake i pretty much know what to do but other than fancy lures and you know shrimp but what kind of shrimp there's all sorts of shrimp. Ah, it depends on where you're going. Uh, if, if you can contact uh, local guides, they'll tell you the patterns that tend to work there uh, before you go uh, or the local fishing well, shops. I get that. I can buy flies. I yep. can ask a guide. I can whatever. But yep. in terms of actually, you know, because sometimes... I go and I look at the bug and I say, hmm, you know, maybe I can do this instead of that and do my own fly and stuff rather than just. Yeah. Um, well, you got to figure that what, what, the, uh, what these fish are going to eat. Um, and it depends on the time of year to some extent and depends on where. Uh, and, and also depends on what the color of the bottom is, if they're feeding off the bottom. Like bonefish and, and uh, 
feed primarily off the bottom. And most of the time when you're fishing for them, you're fishing for in, if you're wading and fishing, you're fishing on what's called marl. It's, it's a, you know, it's that, uh, it's right, white. But nobody, nobody put pen to paper to say, if you're fishing the coastal waters of, you know, BC and North to Alaska, this yeah. is the, this is, these are the food items you're most likely going to encounter and here are some of the principles that there's no such reference yeah we don't we don't that have that kind of, of fishing that goes on here other than if you're a cutthroat fisherman and you're fishing in the mouth of an estuary then there's probably shrimp and there's all all sorts of other things like the guys the guys in in uh in puget sound they have a whole raft of patterns that they specifically use for that environment uh, that is is uh, the fish coming into the estuary to feed uh, on various things. Some of the shrimp, some of the sand lance, some of the small, uh, all sorts of small fish that are around. Uh, if, you're, if you're talking about fishing for salmon, it depends on the time of year and where you are. You know, for instance, for coho, if you're if you're fishing in the salt chuck for coho, and it's near the shore, you can't go wrong with a bucktail or a clouser minnow, <laughs> and all you need to do is tie those in about twenty different colors. Um, okay, so it's very little, very little imitative fly tying, and a lot of it is lures. And well, if you if you're we if don't you're we don't know why they work. We just know that they work. Well, for where, where I go fishing at Honey Nut, it's definitely, it's herring, what, what the fish are eating. So you're, you're fishing different sizes and different colorations of herring. Of herring, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. And then if flies don't work, you're using cut plug. <laughs> so you're using the actual bait. Yeah, uh, and at if least not, that's what I'm using. There are nets <laughs> and grocery stores too, I know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, yeah. that's okay. So, and... and like I say, in the salt water, it's it's a little different because it depends on where you're fishing, and which species you're fishing for. Um, like yeah, we no, the reason I'm asking is because I, you know, I've I've got to see a bunch of flies by now and everything, but coming from from trout and whitefish and you know these freshwater species, um, maybe with the exception of pike, everything I tie has some kind of reasoning behind it so uh and it's connected to some edible item well, if, that i'm somewhat familiar well again with. if you're saltwater fishing for for instance for bonefish uh the and, and there's also snapper around uh i very often was just using a modified clouser minnow uh yeah, but and, basically uh, dave's right on that if you're fishing uh, saltwater flats and that um, you never know what's a fly like that is a classic sort of bonefish fly you can catch permit you can catch snapper you can catch i mean you can even catch a gt on those so yeah yeah you know yeah but uh, there is a shrimp that's in that habitat you're fishing that all these species are feeding on so if you you know so what I'm saying is that you've got a you've got a specific food item that you're trying to imitate there, mm -hmm. right? And so over, you're over. you're doing two things: you're you're going for color, shape, size, and also a presentation that mimics the behavior. Hence the you know yeah. the driving on the bottom. Well, the big the big thing, for example, where you know I mean even in different areas like I fished Cuba and uh, and fishing off the Avalon boats, um, you use a, a completely different color um, type of, you know, I mean, a gotcha and a, 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 and so on is is very similar. Yeah, you know, yeah. There's sort of variations of clouses, but now going where I'm going to Zapata, uh, it's root beer and tan. And that has to do with the, the color of the bottom, large. Yeah. These, lots, lots these, these yeah. insects or the, these creatures that the fish are feeding on, they have to yeah. camouflage themselves to, or, or they don't last long. 
So, so you need to know the color of the bottom you're fishing up against. And that, the exception to that is, is uh, as we found in, in Cuba, is if you're fishing what are called the muds, where, the, where you've got like 20 feet of water, you're not fishing a flat. Uh, and and the, the bonefish are at the bottom and they're stirring up all of the silt on the bottom. And you can tell where they are because you get this dark, darkish color. And there you want a fairly bright colored fly. And, and I just, we just use clousers and just chucked them into the bottom of the mud and then started stripping back through. And you'd catch Jack Craval or you'd catch uh, snapper or you'd catch uh, bonefish depending on who was hanging around. Mm -hmm. And then that's the other thing. If the bonefish are stirring up the bottom, there's gonna be other fish there because they're stirring up all kinds of stuff the other fish come to eat. The other thing to keep in mind too, say example the souk river the fish are just starting to come in so their feet they're they're going to be attracted to things that they've been feeding on in the ocean yeah and to the to some extent up the river then further up the river you'll change your lure to um to something else so it's it's there's too many variables but my my advice is if you're preparing to go to somewhere don't tie over tie too many of different sizes or whatever until you actually get there if you have your if you're available to uh, your fly tying kit you can tie it on site and find out what they're actually using and what people are using and catching fish yeah. on yeah yeah when <clears throat> when the salmon are coming in to spawn <clears throat> by the time they hit the fresh water they don't eat anymore yeah they're not they only attack things that are moving <clears throat> They're not looking for food at all. That, that, that system is shut down. The only system that's working is their spawning yeah. system. Well, there's um, very limited, and, especially and, you're saying there's very limited fishing to what the creatures are feeding on. Various fishes are feeding on different things or not feeding at all. And so yeah, well, you the, can't take well, the, the same salmon approaches with trout, which are year-long residents in their spots. Correct. Yeah. Correct. Okay. But, that, I mean, makes, like, that makes sense. Yeah. Because that was like, you know, why, why is this so different? You know, because is it because we don't know enough or is it just because well, it's something fundamentally different? And that kind of answers, answers well, my question. All, if, well, if, you're, if you're fishing in the S. It only, I mean, that's for spawning fish. Yeah. If you're fishing in the estuaries, you know, and in the immediate vicinity of the estuaries, and it's actually the run is on, then by that point they've kind of they're they're stopped feeding or they're not feeding much on for for food. They're just like you say, territorial. They're hitting what looks like a, is is a threat to them or something that triggers a, a reaction. So that's that's a different proposition than if you're actually fishing the shorelines amongst the kelp beds where the fish are, are living and they aren't migrating yet. Uh, yeah. that's, a whole, that's a whole different ballgame. And that's one of the reasons why I like going to Hanina because that's where the fish are at. They're starting to move towards the stream mouths, but they're not there yet. So they're still porking up on herring as best they can. Yeah. And, and, and there's also some research to show that their eyes change. So um, yes, they don't. They they see blues on the way in, and then when they get up river a little bit, they see pinks, pinks, and then you you. So with the with the uh, uh, Camel River, um, the well for fly fishing at least, blues or pinks are the color. In the souk, I mean, I I've been very successful with green and a silver head, but Dennis uses something entirely different. Don't you, Dennis? Are you still there? Yeah, it's depends on where I am on the river. And it's like I say, there's a lot of variables. So you take, take uh, a, an assortment that's going to uh, work for you. Yeah. And you just have to experiment with it until yeah. you find out what they're hitting. Yeah. And some guys, you'll ask some guys what they're using, and they'll say something completely different than what, what you know, you never know. You just have to try. Oh, yeah, I even... get it. It's it's what works for you, and it's it's very empirical, basically. 
Yeah. And, and, yeah. and if you're fishing, like I say, the kelp beds and, and, and the fish aren't going to the river yet, uh, they, they will feed on whatever is available. And sometimes the herring are an inch and a half long, and sometimes they're six inches and eight inches long. Uh, and so sometimes a little clouser minnow works, and sometimes you've got to take a bucktail that's about four inches long to get any action. Uh, okay, well then, with an introduction like this, I guess it's time to go in and tie something that's somewhat imitative. There you go. <laughs> and so the plan here was, I figure sure. that size size 20 uh, parachute dries are not exactly on the menu. Um, and so a lake fly, and I was like, ah, what lake fly can I do, you know, that we haven't, we haven't done. So I was, I was browsing through this big, thick, heavy book that Dave uses, and there is this little fly called, uh, Polly's green damsel. Uh, so it's meant to imitate a damsel fly. And then, you know, I, um. I, I tied a few samples on on Wednesday night with the uh, with the local guys here in Edmonton, and uh, you know the first thing I get is oh you know a gold rib would do well on that, and so you know I was trying to do the streamlined fly as originally described in the book, and um, apparently that didn't meet with with an awful lot of audience approval. So here is an upgraded version. But um, I will point out the the things that should be left out for the original tie. Now, this fly requires marabou. And marabou, if there's anything worse than deer hair or elk for tying with, is, uh, is marabou, and especially in the, uh, in the dry season. And so the cure for that is a little cup with water that you put on your desk in a place where you're almost not going to spill it not to topple it over so you can you can dip your fingers in there and get them wet for handling the uh, the fluffy stuff okay what i'm using here is a size 12 96 72 hook so a bit longer shank and for the beads, which are again optional, these are 764. And the reason here is to try to keep an overall slim profile to the fly. For a thread, I'm using a, an olive done. This is a six aught, which is maybe a bit thick. Um, by the time you, you, you know, you have to be a little bit more careful with the number of wraps you do. And so the usual thing. Put the thread on, go towards the band of the hook, and stop when you reach the point that's around where the barb used to be before pinching it down. Okay, I'm going to, I'm locking my vise. If I lock it in like this straight, I kind of have to crane my neck to see well. So I'm going to lock it in at a 45 degree angle in order to see better what I'm doing. And so first item is a little bit of green marabou. That's like, you know, a, a lighter, brighter green for the tail. And I already have a piece here. You know, this may or may not be enough. So what I'm going to do is separate some of the muck. And if I need to put you know, marabou twice, I'll put twice. So I'm going to take a little clump. I'm going to put it in here. And attach it and not worry about the length because I'm going to trim it to length later. Okay. If I feel that this may not be enough, I take my feather. I separate a clump of fibers. I get my fingers a little bit wet. It beats spitting on your fly time materials any time of the day, I find. And the other thing with getting your materials wet, you get a true sense of the amount of bulk you're adding. 
Okay, so let's say I wanted a little bit more bulk. I put in the new material, I attach it here, and I bring my thread back to where the tail is properly tied in. Then I trim this. Now comes the second optional material. So I have this, and don't worry about that being too long. Now this is the second material that's entirely optional, and that's a little bit of relatively fine tinsel. You can use wire instead if you prefer. Now, if I want to make my life a little bit easier in terms of not getting too much bulk relative to the rest of the body at the tail end, I'm going to tie in a slightly longer piece here that I'm not going to even cut off. Okay. So I have here a little bit of that tinsel running along the body. And okay, so you can, you can see that I have the tail, I have the tinsel, and now I need something for the body. Um, you can use some dubbing in olive, or actually I like this color. It's a, it's a, um, labeled a tan and it's a hair's ears plus which already has a bit of sparkle. So if you don't want to do the, the tinsel, you can use a bit of sparkly dubbing. Or I have here, this is a, a label, the golden stone, and it's uh, llama wool. Um, but it's um, like a light golden olive that looks like a nice color. You can, you can vary the colors on this, obviously, to whatever, uh, to whatever you like. So pull a bit of fibers from here. And these are these are fairly long. These are fairly long fibers, and you have to be careful that you don't take too much, because one of the problems with this is that you may end up with bulk. And remember, we're trying to do damsels, and they're fairly they're fairly skinny, skinny creatures, unlike the uh, unlike the dragonflies. So what you see in the adults is somehow repeated for the for the nymphs, but um, the dragonfly nymphs are, are really fat and chubby. And the damsels are, you know, more like the mayflies. They're a bit, they're a bit skinnier. Okay, so you want to attach this, and this is a bit challenging with long fiber like this, because sometimes at the end you may not want to just go on exactly as you like it but once you once you catch a few of the fibers so keep keep twisting don't don't give up so catch a few of the fibers and then keep turning and then keep twisting the wool on the body so you get your nice shape if there's too little, you just go back and do another turn or two. Okay. So basically, at this stage, you know, use whatever your favorite dubbing may be. And here we go. This is done. If there's any anything extra here that's sticking out at funny angles or something you don't like, you just you just pull it off. Oh, there's just a few hairs here. There's not much. This is a nice material. It's it's very soft, but it's not necessarily an awful lot easier than others to dub. So here I uh, I'm using my rotary vise, but notice that I just pull a bit of thread down, let it hang, and not worry about it. There's no need for. Uh, for an extra half hitch knot. So here I'm putting in the rib onto the front, secure this with two turns behind, a couple of turns in front, and then cut. Now I'm going to turn the vise and the hook in the vise upside down, and I'm going to get a little bit of legs put on. And what I'm doing is I'm using a guinea fowl feather. This one is dyed some kind of yellow 
greenish color. And you can use plain undyed ones. And I, I got one of those feathers that's more of a more of a body feather that's nicely patterned, but it's also fairly soft. You know, you can use pretty much any soft hackle stuff that you have. If it, you have a partridge dyed olive, for example, would be nice, uh, nice fibers. Um, anything off a pheasant skin that's got greenish color to it. You know, all those body feathers you get on a on a pheasant are fantastic, you know. So anyway, get myself a little clump of this stuff. Measure it as well as I can. Again, there's there's room for, for adjusting here. Put one loop of thread over the material too, if you want to be more secure. Double check that the length is okay. We don't want it to go past the point of the hook. And then secure this with a couple of proper tight turns. Once you've done that, trim this close to the body and flip the hook over in the vise again. I mean, with the vise is what I'm trying to say. Okay, now for the final touch on this fly, I'm going to get a little bit of a wing on top, and that's going to be some darker olive marabou, and I have a bunch here. And so I took, I took a feather, I separated some of the fibers, and here they are. This was a little bit wetter a few minutes ago. And again, I'm going to put it in a little bit longer. I can always pull it in to length or I can trim it at the end. So here I can pull a little bit. And this is fairly skinny. And on the other side, I have a few more good fibers here. This doesn't look like much, but it's actually quite quite a bit and it's pretty good stuff. Put it here and if things become a little unruly, just moisten your fingertips a little bit with the water, moisten the feather and things will be much, much better behaved. Okay. Secure this nicely. If you want to be triple sure, do another turn. And then trim this off. Okay. Now, depending on how you like your things, you could you could just leave the head as it is. You know, the gap behind the bead is usually one concern you have at this stage that you want to make sure that's filled and that's filled on this fly. If you want to give this fly even more bling than it already has, one nice finishing touch you can do is you can take a little bit of peacock and not much, a couple of thin fibers and just attach that here behind the, oops, Broke this one off. And do two, three turns of peacock curl right behind the bead. It gives a little bit of contrast, it gives you a darker color, and it gives you that little magic that only peacock can provide. And you don't have to cut this. This one, once fully secured, can be simply cut off. Uh, can be simply broken off. Not, I was going to say, you don't have to cut it, so you can just break it. Okay. A couple of whip finishes. This way, no need for head cement. And the fly is almost done. Okay? So remember, you can drop the bead, the peacock, and the ribbing. The other ingredients are the original pattern. Now, what needs to be done is trimming these wings 
wing and tail to something approaching more realistic proportions for one of these flies, which means you want the wing to be not much longer than about halfway down the body. And you want the tail to be one half to one third of the hook shank length. And you can do this actually easier if you take the fly out of the vise. So you can you can just try marabou's pretty fragile generally. So you can just use thumb and forefinger and try to pinch and break it off. And that will give you a nice ragged edge. Okay. If for whatever reason that's not working too well, uh, pretty much on the same shelf where you buy your uh, your Sally Hansen um, hardest nail, um, you know, magic head cement, you can buy your Sally Hansen tweezers, and these come in handy as well. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to pinch this to size using my tweezers. Just grab a few fibers at a time and just go pinch. You'll also get a ragged appearance. Okay. All right. I think that's well enough for the for the pinching there. And then I'll do something similar here for the wing. It's just that with the with the marabou fibers, they tend to be a little sticky. They'll stick to the tweezers. And the little bits of fluff you're pinching off are going to fly around. And so it's probably vacuum time after this. OK. And ah, maybe I want this to be a little shorter here. So hopefully this is going to catch so many fish that the rest of the ragging of the fly is going to be done by the, by the fish themselves. Okay. So this is what I would call finished product. And it's another one of those, you know, green olive things that seem to be pretty good at, at catching fish in lakes. So um, that's it. And you can tie, you know, one size bigger, one size smaller. That would be the, um, the range. I've seen, I've seen damsel nymphs that are about this size and smaller. So I would go down to a size 14. Most people tie these things, I think, in 10s and 12s. In my experience at size 10 fly, can be a little bit big. And that's it on top.